Well, good morning, everyone. All right. So, hey, uh, before we get going, hopefully you got a uh, program coming in. We kind of reformatted it a couple weeks ago, try to cut down on some of the paper and stuff. And so uh, there's a fill in the blanks and some uh, scriptures and stuff that we cover. And then on the back of it is kind of the calendar, the events that are taking place uh, over the next uh, week or so, and so make sure you grab one because it's also going to kind of let you know what's taking place. You can always look online as well, all right? So we are in the study of First Peter, and so uh, as I mentioned before, the idea was way back probably 18 months ago or so, and we talked about um, just kind of folks feeling a lot of tension and stress about what was taking place in the world, and, uh, and specifically with younger couples, with younger folks with kids, they're just like a lot, lot of tension and like not digging what's taking place and how are we going to navigate through. And, and so the question was like, how do we respond to the world in which we live in? And so, which I think is a great question. And so, obviously, um, maybe you didn't know this, but First Peter actually addresses that, talks about how do we live in an environment that is going against some of the t- beliefs that we have. And of course, in, in those days, they were being, the Christians were being slaughtered, literally killed by Nero. And so Peter lays out to them kind of some direction about how you live in a world in which you live. What do you, how do you respond? How do you deal with it? How do you do that? And so in, in, uh, if you've missed any of them, there's, I don't know if there's CDs now, but there's typically CDs in the, in the information area. Right when you walk out, you make a right. And then also, um, you can go online and you can download the, the message online. And so in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, he talks about what Christ has done for us. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter talks about what Jesus says about us. And we talked about kind of the pyramid of relationships, that if you imagine you have kind of a pyramid of relationships, you have you know, acquaintances and stuff, and then as you climb up to, to the point of it, that is where you find the people that matter the most to you. And what we've learned, not only from Scripture, but also recently in the last 30 years or so, science teaches that what, you, what that person or persons at the top of your pyramid say about you or to you shapes your beliefs and shapes how you respond uh, to the world in which we live in. And obviously, Peter is, is basically teaching that to them, that, hey, this is what Christ says about you. And then the last part of chapter two lays out integrity. And that is that you respond with integrity in the area of temptation, in the area of authority, people in authority over your life, and in the area of suffering, not suffering because you twisted your ankle, but suffering because for the cause of Christ, and how, to, how you respond to that. And that begins to lay the groundwork of the next chapter 3 and chapter 4 about how you live in the world in which we live in, all right? So back to kind of where we're at. So Peter says that there are, there are two economies or two worlds, not globes, but two, two worlds. One is the fleshly world, and that is the one that's controlled by Satan. We talked about it in week one and week two. And then there's God's economy, and that is where we're living by the Spirit. We're being obedient to the teachings of Scripture. And so he says to us that you are aliens or strangers, or and strangers, in this world. And aliens mean to live alongside of a house, and strangers mean to be a person without a citizenship. And so then the question is, is, well, was he talking to people who didn't have citizenships in Rome? And the answer was, no, they had citizenships in Rome, but he was telling them that they are living alongside of, as Christ followers, they're living alongside of the people who live in the world. And that your citizenship ultimately is in heaven. It isn't on whatever citizenship that you may have. It's not about that. It's about ultimately heaven. And that we shouldn't get cozy with the environment in, in, in which we're living in, that we should just live alongside of it, but choose to live God's way, all right? And so we covered that over the last couple weeks. If you missed any, again, you can grab a CD on the way out. So today we're going to start talking about relationships, and next week as well, all right? And so whatever the context of the relationship, whether it's siblings, 
whether it's coworkers, whether it's marriage, your fiance, whatever the case is, the principles are applicable through it. And, and so how do we have great relationships in life? And so at the very top of your outline, one action that's needed for great relationships is, and you can fill in the word as you write it with great confidence, is submission, all right, is submission. Now, write it down, take a deep breath, and ask, when's, the pa- when's this going to be over with, Pastor Dan? I remember years ago, I had a couple that I was doing premarital counseling with, and her grandma had come in, I think it was from the East Coast, <clears throat> and I happened to be doing a marriage series, and I was talking about submitting, and her grandma, who was probably in her mid-80s, maybe close to 90, she leaned over to her granddaughter, who, who I was doing the counseling with her and her fiance, and she says, I'm leaving. I am not listening to submitting to anything, anywhere. I'm going. She's like, Granny, just relax. Let him share with you. And she's like, I don't want to hear anything that he has to say. So anyway, she shares that with me when we meet back. I go, well, what did she think when she ended? She goes, well, when you ended, she's like, okay, I can do that. (laughs) So hang in with me because the word submission doesn't have a positive definition in our culture, right? In, in the 21st century, it doesn't have. So here are some of the definitions in the 21st century of the word submission or submit. Um, it means to back down, bend to another person's will, comply, cower, crawl, cringe, give in, and then the best one is live a dog's life, all right? Now, in the biblical times, the word submit wasn't a bad word. It actually was a good word. It was actually that something very, that was very positive. And so in your outline, the, the, the biblical term for submission is to have the courage to give up my rights to meet another person's needs. So that's what, when, we, when Peter talks about that, Paul talks about it in Ephesians, he's talking about giving up your rights to meet another person's needs. That that is the secret sauce of having great relationships is this idea of submission, okay? So <clears throat> I know that you're not sold yet, so keep going. We're gonna go on. You're gonna be that granny. By the time you leave, you're gonna go, I could do that, all right? So, so here we go. So there are three basic ways that we can live our life. The first one in your outline is that we can live my way. Okay, and I don't mean Dan's way. I mean, whatever your name is, you can put it in there, right? Now, all of us, by default, live in that world, amen, right? You wake up in the morning, and that's the world in which you live in. In fact, if I can be very candid with you and be totally transparent, I care about what I care about. I really don't care about what you care about because I care about me, Right? And that is, not saying it's right, I'm just saying, that is the fleshly definition of living a very meistic world. And all of us, by default, live in that world. All right? So we live in a very meistic world. Second one in your outline is the other's way. And that's where you'll hear people say, well, I have to do that. Right? If I don't, then fill in the blank. All right? Now, what people confuse in this area of submission, and we're going to change the word here in a moment, but what they think about submission is they think about that's where it's at in others' others' way. But actually, that is not the biblical definition of it. We don't submit for the other person. We We submit because God has called us to submit. So it becomes a God component, and then we'll talk about why that is and, and, and the, the benefit of that here uh, in a few moments. And then the last one is, is that we are to live ultimately in God's world, amen? We are to live in, in God's world. <clears throat> so when it comes to the world in which you live in, the first one is by default, the other one is because someone's got you in an arm bar and you have to, and then ultimately God wants us to live alongside of and ultimately live in, God, in God's world, okay? So we're going to talk about the why we do it and the how, okay? So uh, the first one in your outline is why should I be, and we're going to use the word unselfish instead of submit, okay? So why should I be unselfish in my life? Now, there are many people who live very selfish lives, 
okay? In fact, maybe you're here today or you're watching online, but you live a very self-centered life, and for you, your thought is, it's working. Why would I want to change and live an unselfish life? I'm selfish, it's working, okay? The problem is, in a relationship where there's a person who has a selfish attitude, it will work for a season, but it will not work for all seasons. Eventually, that relationship is going to change, whether it dissolves completely or whether it changes in the closeness and whatever else. But at some point, there is going to be a time where the other person says, I can't do that. Right? So if you sit here and you kind of go, hey, I live in a selfish world and it's working for now, but it isn't going to work for a long time, right? And there may be people that you, you could think about who, who have that kind of in, in uh, situation that's taking place. So here's the first one in your outline. And this is why should I be unselfish? S- s- uh, selfishness, number one, is the source of conflict. And we're going to see this next week as well. It's the source of conflict. <clears throat> in relationships, and this is true in marriage, siblings, whatever the case is, we always attack the symptoms. And you've heard me say a thousand times, you cannot solve the problem by looking at the symptoms. You have to get to the core of what it is, right? There is a difference between triage medic- medicine, when you get you know, medevaced in, and when you're actually getting long-term trying to figure out, well, what's causing it, right? And in relationships, you can't just continue to do the triage, the, the band-aids, the, you know, the stitches, that, that kind of stuff. At some point, you got to figure out why something is taking place. And so conflict starts because of selfishness. So let's take a look. James chapter 1, and then we'll get into 1 Peter in a second. James chapter uh, 4, verse 1 says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Stop at the uh, uh, question mark. You want to write someone's name in there, don't you? You want to say, Pastor Dan, I'll tell you what's the problem in my life, and you want to introduce me to that person, right? In fact, you wish they were here so that they could hear today's message. Amen? Amen. All right, but that's not what James says. Don't they come from, what's the word? Your desires that battle within you. In other words, You live in your world and you are an expert at your world and you care about what you care about and frankly, you don't care about what they care about, okay? That is the desire that you have. In verse two, he goes on, you want something, but you don't get it. And here's the extent that relationships will go through. You kill, sometimes physically, most of the time it's just talking about kind of in words and so forth. You covet, but you do not have what you want. And then we come right back to the reminder, you quarrel and you fight, right? Verse goes on. You do not have um, because you do not ask God. That hasn't even occurred to you to ask God for it because you want it and you expect them to give it to you, and if they don't give it to you, there's a problem. All right, are you with me? Verse uh, uh, verse three, and when you ask, right, if you get to that point of asking God, you ask, uh, uh, you uh, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, because it's all about you. It's all about you getting your wishes, your ways, your wants, your whatever. And then it goes on and it says that you may spend, it, uh, spend what you get on your pleasure. And that word pleasure means, it, it is the word hedonism or hedonistic. And that means basically fleshly desires, all right? So, so we, have, we have a desire to have, we have a desire to feel, we have a desire for pleasure. And those are God-given desires. But the problem is, is when we begin to use people to achieve that, That's a problem. So God has given us things to enjoy and people to love. And when we invert that equation, then we use people for our enjoyment to get whatever these desires are that we have in our life. And when that happens, you have fireworks in life. And relationships by nature have built into it 
conflict issues. It's called your desires or expectations in a relationship. Have you ever talked to a young person who's getting married? And they tell you, and maybe you're seasoned in marriage, and they start telling you all the things that's going to take place in marriage. It's, it's a great joy. <laughs> it is. And I love doing premarital counseling because I, I, I love hearing it. And then, you know, at some point you got to reel them in and kind of go, okay, that ain't always going to happen, brother. <laughs> right? And so you have built into it, and, and that's true in any relationships. You have expectations that you desire for them to do, dot, 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 and when it doesn't happen, we end up having problems. So selfishness, and we'll look at this next week as well, selfishness is, the so- uh, is a source of conflict, and I, I would say it's a key area. Number two in your outline, unselfishness, so here's the opposite, unselfishness is the secret to change. All right? If you're, all relationships are evolving. Would you agree with that? If you treat a relationship the same today and, and, and it's always the same, that isn't, that's true in parenting. You start off, you tell your kids, don't touch, don't do this, don't do that. And as they get older, it rolls into coaching. It's no longer parental control. Now it's a coaching thing. You're coaching them, you're encouraging them. Have you thought about that? You sure that's a good idea? Where before it's like, don't, don't, don't you know, that kind of stuff, right? In marriages, right? Be, let's be honest. Can we be honest for a minute or should I just leave, right? If guys, so ladies, plug your ears. If you treat your wife the same way, Tammy and I have been married, we'll be going to 35 years here in, in June. If, if, you've been mar- if you're married and you treat your wife the same way you did 35 years ago, talk about a whiff, whoosh, you missed every single time, right? Because the needs change in a person's life. Amen? So if we want to change a person, then what we do is we nag them. And that works great, doesn't it? Oh, it doesn't. Oh, I thought it did. I got to change my notes. All right? So so look what verse 1 says. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands so that, and again, I mention that oftentimes when it's in there, so you you got the condition at the first half of the verse and you got a promise at the second half of the verse, right? He says, wives, submit to your husband, uh, wives, in the same way, submit to your husbands so that, so here comes the promise, if you do this, this is what's going to take place, if any of them do not believe the word, in other words, at that time, there were a lot of be- people who were Gentiles who came into faith, or saving faith in Jesus Christ. Some of them were Jews. The church was fairly new. So you had a lot of people that were married and they accept Jesus Christ. And now all of a sudden, the wife, in this case, the wife is saying, I want my husband to come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And Peter is saying, so do we. But listen, How you're going to share the gospel with them isn't how you think. It's not bringing a CD from Pastor Dan and going, you really need to listen to this. Okay? He's he's not saying that. So look look what he says. He says, um, he he says, so that they believe, and then it says, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. In other words, Actions speak louder than words, right? So, so when we think about change in a person's life, our first thought is to nag, complain, gripe, fold our arms, say it's not fair, flop on the ground, do all the different things. And he's saying, no, if you're wanting change in a relationship, then you need to really start thinking about your behavior. If you're wanting to know, hey, how do I respond to a world that's outside with Jesus Christ's love, he says, you need to pay attention to how you're behaving, all right? Second, a third thing in your outline is selfishness short circuits your prayers. How's your prayer life doing? Anybody got any answers to prayer? And this is always kind of a funny one because we think that our prayer life is successful when our relationship with God is successful. That's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is how you respond to people around you. Your earthly relationships have a direct impact to your prayer life, right? If we're not treating anybody worth anything, our prayer life is going to be that. Now, why would that be? Think about it. If you're living a selfish life, you're living under the assumption that you're going to make your way, you're going to do your thing, it's all about you. 
Prayer, if you strip away all the teachings about prayer and you say, what is the core of prayer? Prayer is this, God, I can't, but you can, right? That is prayer. If someone finds themselves in a bad situation, how many times have you said it or I said it or we've heard people say, we've done everything, all I know to do now is to pray. Translation, I can't fix it, only God can, right? So when I'm living a me-centered life, I'm at basically pushing God aside, and I'm living my own life, and I'm doing my thing, and I'm trying to solve my problems, and I'm the way maker, and I'm everything myself, and, and so he says, when you do that, then you're not going to experience answered prayer, and so in verse 7, he says, do this so that nothing stops your prayers, all right? So, so the reasons why it reduces conflict it changes people's lives, and it ultimately makes our prayer life more successful, all right? So then the second part of what he lays out is how. How do you live an unselfish life? And I have no idea. Do you have any suggestions, or we just go home now, okay? So let me give you some, some ideas. And this is a struggle for all of us, all right? And so here, first one in your outline is that understanding, so number one, understanding, and that is consider others' needs. If we're going to live an unselfish life, then we have to consider the needs of others. Verse 7, husbands, in the same way, be considerate, all right? The word considerate is more than kindness, all right? It means to live together according to knowledge. In other words, if you have a relationship, whatever the context of that relationship is, all right? In this case, it's marriage, but in any relationship, if you don't understand that person, you are never going to be considerate toward them. Okay? So I like to say this. I have a PhD, earned PhD, in Tamiology. <laughs> it's taken me 34 years to do it, all right? It's the toughest coursework I've ever taken. She's not here. None of you will rat me out. You got my back. Raise your right hand. We're in it, brother, all right? So, so the truth is, that's, that's really true, and I, and I tell couples this too, that you ought to be an expert in your spouse, your fiance, your siblings, your children's life, you ought to be an expert in their life. In fact, where you think about in, in, in Proverbs where it says, train up a child in a way he should go, and when he's, old, when he's old, he'll return back to it, doesn't mean you drag him to church. That is not the way that that verse lays, it flows. It means that you train your child in the bent of their personality. And you understand what, as Buddy wrote a book, what tick, what makes them tick and what ticks them off. If you parent the same way for all your children, you are making a miserable wreck of your parenting. Your kid is going to be encouraged, discouraged, you're motivated, whatever the case, and they're all going to be different, aren't they? Right? They're not the same. And the same thing is true in a relationship with your spouse, your sibling, your coworkers, or whatever, you have to understand them in order for them, for you to be considerate uh, to them in their lives. And so in Philippians chapter four, verse five, it says this, let everyone see that you are unselfish and considerate in some of the things that you do. All, on all the things that you do. Oh, wow, okay, I didn't know, I missed that. I'm dyslexic, I just skipped right over that word. So then there's a skill set that you're gonna need, all right? And, and, and the skill set that you're gonna need, it's called, which is in your outline, not a fill in the blank, but it's called listening, all right? Again, you by nature are not good at listening. And here's why, because you care about what you care about. In fact, in conversations, be honest, in conversations, when somebody is talking about something that you don't care about, you're just waiting for, you don't even care if it's a comma. You're just looking for them to suck in some air, and you're going right in. Right? It's true. It's true. And so we need to make sure that we're working on 
being a, being a good listener. So let's take a couple things that we need to learn about. Letter A in your outline is you have to be willing to work at it. And so, again, unless you're kind of trained in a field that your job is to listen to people, it's not natural. And even if you're trained in a job where you're supposed to listen to people, it's not natural, right? You got to be careful because if you're, you know, listening and you're not like engaged in on, on your A game, you're hearing the peanuts, you know, so what is that, uh, you know, wah, 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 right? You know what I'm talking about? And, and so we have to make sure that, that we do that. So we, we want to make sure that we're, will, uh, we're working on it. Letter B in your outline is let them tell it their way. Okay, if you're going to be considerate of other people's needs, you have to work at listening and you have to allow them to tell it their own way. So I'm going to go out on a limb, folks. This is the last service. All right. Women communicate differently than men. Seriously. I read it last night. All right. So here's the issue. And I'm going to paint with a broad brush and be 100% right. Okay? Women communicate from emotion. And this isn't bad, right? This is the part of knowing the person, knowing and understanding them, right? So it isn't good or bad. So women speak from emotion. That's why I use the illustration of spaghetti. Women are spaghetti, men are waffles, right? Women have everything connected, men have everything in these nice little cubicles, Right? So when a woman speaks, she speaks from emotion, and you don't know when, and my wife will do it sometimes, and we kind of chuckle. She's like, I'm changing the book. I'm like, what do you mean you change the book? I'm changing the subject. So she has to alert me, who's trained at listening, she has to alert me that she's putting away that conversation and she's bringing out a new conversation, right? Because otherwise, I'm still like going, so is, the, is this the same paragraph, or? Are we still going on, right? And so when guys speak, guys speak differently than women. This is true. If you haven't seen your buddy in 35 years, you run into him at Home Depot, right, over in the drill section, and you're like, hey, dude, what's going on, man? I haven't seen you in a long time. And you're like, right, in five minutes, with some body language, some gestures, some doing some, some kind of weird things, we know that he has kids and grandkids, he's changed his profession, he just recently moved over here, everything is going good, and he's really happy in life. And we fist pump, and five minutes later, we're out the door. Amen. Right? <laughs> right? You say, like when guys go, hey, what's up? That, that is like 10,000 words. The guy just says, it's good, dude. What's up? It's fine. We already know what it means, right? Now, do ladies communicate that way? No. no. If, they, if you meet a girl, a lady that you haven't seen in, let's say, three days at Home Depot, <laughs> right, you're closing that place down. The manager's on the phone. It's like, ma'am, please leave aisle four. Our stocking crew is coming out and there's going to be forklifts all over the place. You're like, I haven't seen her since like Tuesday. Am I right? Yeah. So that's exactly right. So when a guy comes home from work and he says, man, I had an awful day today, right? The woman wants to hear everything that has happened in that day. He just told you he had a bad day. Right? Now, if the woman comes home and she says, I've had a bad day, here's the problem with the guys. So, ladies, don't pay attention to me, all right? You're sitting there and you're listening because you're waiting for a pause because you have a solution, because you're a fixer. She's wanting, she's just warming up, dude. She's just been in her, you know, she's like stretching out. She hadn't even started the run yet right? She's just getting going. And she's in word 10, and you're ready to fix the problem because in your life, 11 words to finish a conversation? That's so many, right? And she's just like limbering up, oh, 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 like that. And so you're looking for a pause 
so that you can then interject what the solution is, right? Now, again, I'm newly married, and I'm just telling you that that style does not work. Because at some point, she may come to a place where she wants a solution, but until she gives you that thumbs up, she's not talking about a solution. She's simply talking about her emotions, right? So you have to allow them to speak at however it is, whether it's male or female, whatever it is, and you have to let them tell their story in life. And this is, as God is my witness, I've heard so many guys tell me that when they come home from work and they say, my life was bad, they, they all feel bad about not communicating more and their you know, wife is kind of following them around the house. Well, why is it bad? What's going on? Let's go to HR. We'll figure this thing out, right? And, and they're like, you know, is it wrong, Pastor Dan, to just kind of go, give me some space, and I said, no, it's a thing where you have to help them understand that you have shared, you shared your story. That's it. And then at some point, if you want to bring it up down the road, then that's fine. But you had a bad day, right? And then vice versa, guys. When the lady is at word 225,000 <laughs> and she still has a few more to go, you have to listen. Right? You have to allow them to tell the story. And you may have to ask clarifying questions. And I, and I do that with Tammy. So is that what you're asking or is that what you're asking? Right? Is, are we still in the same book? Or are, we in a different, are we in a different closet now in a different book? You know, right? Because it's, it's tough to follow the conversations of how we communicate. It isn't good or bad. It's how God has made us. And not to understand how God has wired us is not very smart. Amen? Amen? All right, I have nothing else to say. Let her, let her see in your outline. The, th the, third, uh, the third one is you make eye contact when you listen, right? So you not only listen with your ears, but you listen with your eyes. And years ago, I had a guy, and he was hilarious. He was the one-liner king. And he came into my office one day, and he's like, yeah, the other day, my wife came into the room, the TV room, and she said, let's talk. And I'm thinking, okay, so here it goes. And I said, no problem, honey. Just don't stand in front of the TV. <laughs> right? Funny, but not really productive. Right? So we need to make sure that we listen with our ears and our eyes as well. Number, uh, letter two, uh, number two in your outline, and that is respect. And respect is appreciating other people's value. In verse seven in the Amplified, it says this, in the same way you, uh, uh, in the same way you married men should live considerately with your wife. So that's kind of the idea, understanding them. And he talks about kind of intellectually recognizing that. And it goes on, he says, honor the woman as physically the weaker, but realizing that you are joint heirs of God's grace, God's unmerited favor of life in order that your prayer uh, your prayers may not be hindered or cut off, uh, otherwise you cannot pray effectively, okay? So what does that mean? So he's talking about respect, and he's talking about respect being reciprocal, okay? Respect is two ways. Respect, when again, you strip it away, it means I value you. And if you respect me, it means you value me, okay? So if we don't have respect, we're basically saying I don't value you. And so you'll have guys say, you know, I'm the man, I'm the spiritual house of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the house, and, you know, I'm this and I'm that, which is biblically true. But Jesus is our example, and Jesus is the head of the church, and he said he forfeited all of his rights to come to earth to die as a servant. So if you want to be the head no problem, I'm totally game for that, but be a servant and willing to die for your family, okay? And when you do, then you'll have a response, right? So, so it isn't, it's, just, it's reciprocal. Now, the struggle in relationships are when they're, when they're broken or fractured in some way, it's like, I'm not going to respect them because they're not respecting me. 
So at some point, this is where you got to decide that you're not going to live alongside of a person's house. You're going to live in God's kingdom, and you're going to say, God, I'm going to trust you in this. I don't like it. I don't think it's fair. Whatever it is, be honest with God. But at some point, you have to. Otherwise, it's a tit for tat. And the relationship will never change when two people are selfish. Okay? And so you have to be willing to take that step and say, I'm going to believe. It, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, when you do things, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than yourself. It doesn't mean you walk around going, I'm a loser, I'm a loser. It means that you value other people, right? It, it's important to do. So we want to make sure that we're, that, we're, that we're respecting them. Number three in your outline. The third thing is, is that you want to sacrifice, and that is an act of... Uh, uh, act on others' behalf, all right? And so in verse one, it says, your godly lives will speak, in the Living Bible, it says that your godly lives will speak to them better than any words, all right? So our actions matter. When people are in broken relationships, I will say, I don't care what they say, just pay attention to their actions because that's really what they believe, Okay, words are cheap. I can say anything. I can say I'll meet every one of your needs. I love you more than, you know, whatever. I can do all that kind of stuff. But if I don't have actions behind it, they're meaningless, right? And and so this is the idea that we're, we're not wanting to just simply give words. We're actually wanting to actually live it out in our life. And so in, in your outline in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, in the Living Bible, again, it says, let us stop just saying we love people. Let us really love them. Show it by our actions, right? So, so, so again, it's, it's not enough to say I love you. You have to be willing to have action behind it. And, and so again, and, and I like to pick on the guys, and you know, I love you, I got your back, but, but you know, you'll hear a guy say, man, I would be willing to die for my family. Translation, a guy kicks in the door, you know, he comes in, I'm going to run for whatever I'm going to run for, and I'm willing to take one for the family. And then, you know, we, we bump ch- chests and we high five each other and we all leave. But I say to them, well, you know what? That's nice that you would do that. But the reality is God's not saying if a bad guy comes in your house, are you willing to wrestle with the person? God is saying when your wife has a need or your child has a need, are you willing to forego what you want to do for them? Is that what you're wanting to do? Right? So so don't give me a, I love, you know, I love, but are you willing to give up a weekend of golf or going to, you know, boating or skiing or whatever your hobby is? And ladies, are you willing to give up your, you know, trip to get a manicure? I mean, are you willing to do that? Because if you're not willing to do it, all you're talking is words. And so here's the key part in relationships. Showing acts of love isn't the big thing. I took all my kids to, you know, Disney World. That's great. You spent 20,000 bucks and you had a terrible time. It's not the happiest place on earth. I could have saved you some money, right? The reality is, and if you did that, God bless you. We've done that with our kids as well. But the reality is, it's the little acts of kindness that are the marks of love in a relationship. It's not the big thing right? It's not the Disneyland dad kind of thing. It's the little acts of kindness that build in a relationship. And, and that's, what we, that's what we need to do in our life. And that's kind of part of the, the sacrifice, all right? And so in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, 13, verse 5, it, says, it talks about love. It says, love is, not ru- uh, love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. So here is the struggle for all of us when it comes to living an unselfish life. To be unselfish, I must, in your outline, I must let go of your fear. Fear is the one thing that will paralyze you when it comes to following Christ. Fear literally will stop you in your tracks and prevent you from being obedient to what Scripture says. 
And so when it comes to this idea of living an unselfish life, you're like, well, Pastor Dan, if I live an unselfish life, life then you're going to tell me all the things that you fear. I'm going to be run over. I'm going to give up my identity. I'm going to be the doormat. I'm going to this. I'm going to be that. Right? And, and, and what I want to do is just kind of push back to you and say this. Are you willing to trust God's word in the midst and the promise in his word? Because, see, if you don't, you'll never know what that relationship could be because it's going, to end, it's going to be exactly what it is now. But if you're willing to take a risk and allow God to move in a person's life and you be obedient to the part that God has called you to, let's see what God can do. Let's see what he can do. And so he says in, in verse 6, he says, do what is right and do not give way to your fear. And at the end of the day, in relationships, marriages, friendships, whatever the case is, the one thing that stops you from that relationship developing is fear. Are you willing to release it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and grace, Lord. Thank you for this time together. And Lord, we just recognize that it's so easy to get caught up in the ways of the world and living our relational life as the world would have us. And Father, I pray that each of us would take a step back, look at the key relationships in our life, and ask, are we living God's way in the midst of that relationship? And for the relationships that are struggling here, whether it's marriage or friendships or siblings or whatever the case is, Lord, I just pray that your spirit would intervene into those relationships. And Father, that you would give us the boldness to be obedient to your word. And Father, we give you all the praise for the mending of the relationships that you're going to do. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and I want to give you that opportunity to invite Jesus into your life. And so if you'll just pray with me, if that's where you're at, you're like, I need a relationship with Jesus. As I say this prayer, just silently repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I am a sinner, that I have missed the mark. And Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, there's some green bags on the way out. You can grab one. If you're online watching, you can text the number on the screen. So we look forward to seeing you guys next week. We'll continue in the conf uh, conflict thing. And you guys have a super Sunday. Wow, what an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us in person when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. We can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week, and remember, God loves you.